to thank uh, the possibility of organizing the one on mute talks is thanks to both uh, NTNU and University of Oslo. And would like to really thank all the MCT teachers and students, especially Carolina, Egil, Jorgen, Sepper, Sri J, Eric, Robin, Daniel here from, well, Robin and Daniel are uh, from the teaching boards, but they are MCT students, thanks here in Trondheim. Also thanks uh, Mary Espen uh, in um, Oslo, and also Alexander and Anders, but uh, thanks to all the MCT uh, team. And so today we have, we are very happy to have um, Tuna also with us. Tuna is a very well-known associate professor here at NTNU, and a very prolific uh, musician and performer, and you, uh, she's very well known uh, from contributing to Trondheim Voices, but also other groups and bands that she will be showing us. And she has done here uh, in Trondheim and TNU an artistic PhD uh, research. And so we are really looking forward to know more about it. And the MCT students know her too, because she was a jury member of the physical computing workshop. So please uh, give a warm welcome to Tunausa. So everything's working. This is a very complex situation. We still don't know all the consequences. We need a thorough research and a serious discussion. That will take some time and effort. We do not know what we really know. We do not know what we really mean. We do not know what is going to happen. Can we endure this situation of not knowing? Can we respect this situation of not knowing? And in the meantime, can we be kind? This is a very we do this is a very this is a very com this is a very com this is a cap we do we we do we we do we still don't know can we 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 still can we still can we still don't we still we still don't we still we still don't know we still we still don't know yeah, 
Well, I also know she Yeah, he is. Yeah. We still, we still can this, we do this, we do this is a very, this can, this is a very, we do this, we do not. What is going to happen? No. Not know still. Only. Can we endure this situation of not knowing? Can we respect this situation of not knowing? And, And in the meantime. meantime Can, Can we, we be, be kind? kind? Thank you. We just have some sound again. Uh, and... Um, Um, just check that everything is no delays or something is going on. Ah, there it is. Okay, um, yes, my name is Tune, um, and I'm, as you see, a vocalist working with, I just turn this a little bit down, working with uh, live improvisation um, and working with live electronics. And these two things represent uh, two important turns in my musical life, the meeting with improvisation and the meeting with live electronics. The meeting with improvisation uh, made me experience uh, music in a very different way, just both as a listener and a performer. The meeting with live electronics uh, made me... Um, be or made me able to take a new position as a musician in the improvised interplay. So, uh, what I want to talk about today is, uh, uh, I'll just be systematic about it, let me see. Okay. Interesting. Ah. Uh, I want to talk about how um, the work with voice and electronics generates uh, what I think of as new musical material. Uh, and also the organization of voice sound naturally uh, is uh, makes uh, new possibilities for the vocalist. And then I will talk about how these new uh, possibilities makes it uh, makes me able to take new roles in the improvised interplay. If I have time, I will also talk about my vocal ensemble and how we work with live electronics there. And uh, finally, I want to discuss challenges with you, hopefully. So, uh, 
I will not do a very big name dropping on where I come from. Oh, you see it here. Yeah. You see the screen? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Should I move a little bit or it's okay? Yeah. Um, I will not do a very much name dropping, but uh, to tell you where I come from musically, I would say that I belong to a field of the modern jazz impro, uh, European or Nordic uh, modern jazz impro scene. But also uh, that I see myself as a part of something you could call the vocal performance art scene, uh, using uh, also this spoken word tradition or, or the <clears throat> relating also to the spoken word tradition. Sorry, oops. <clears throat> so, uh, and these traditions have some uh, uh, important premises that makes it easy to bring in uh, the live electronics for me as a vocalist. Uh, first of all, I talked about the improvisation, the, this uh, processual, processual and, and intuitive uh, way of playing, uh, where you can create the music in the moment together with your in interaction with your colleagues. Uh, the collective approach to this improvisation, uh, which is opposed to this uh, the soloist and the accompaniment, accompaniment situation. Uh, where a, a, a position where every uh, musician is, um, what you say, more equal in in the improvised expression, um, and of course the focus of, of sound and timbre as musical parameters, as opposed to uh, solely relating to melody and harmonics and rhythm. So in in this uh, open genre, uh, sometimes uh, even the sound. Uh, and the timbre is replacing the melody and rhythmic, which makes it uh, a, a place to come with your electronic sounds. <clears throat> and not at least uh, in what I experience as a very openness towards a lot of genres in this modern uh, improv scene, uh, makes it possible to bring in uh, different sounds, different materials and so on. <clears throat> Sorry for my voice. Uh, so, uh, and also we have this, um, the, the premises in this vocal performance art uh, genre, uh, which has been focusing on how the voice uh, can be sound and how you can explore. Yeah, uh, Lenmin Floske, Evin? He's getting something to drink. Yeah. Evin? It's actually my bottle. <laughs> yes. You can take it. Oh, thank you. Oh, my savior. <laughs> Professor Avon Bronsig, everybody. <laughs> so, as I said, this, this vocal performance art tradition of exploring voice as sound, <clears throat> and also how this uh, tradition and the spoken word uh, and the sound poet tradition really uh, uses text uh, in different ways and dissolves text and use it abruptly and use it as sound uh, more than meaning, which will I come back to. So, uh, <clears throat> when I uh, started working with improvising, improvised music early in the 90s, I started with uh, an a cappella quartet led by Almir Grakness, which you probably know, she works at the jazz department here, called Kvitratten. And uh, that was a really great experience. We had four voices. We could uh, blend into each other's sound. We could pick out of each other's sound. And we could um, shift roles very seamlessly. Uh, when I tried to do this in the instrumental setting with drums and synthesizers, uh, I found it much more difficult with the voice. Um, Every time I try to accompany something or make a comment or, or go into other layers of the music like I could with the vocal ensemble, my voice came out more like human utterings. You, you, the, the voice was just too dominating. So it was really difficult. So uh, at that time I had already discovered uh, the, some uh, use of electronics. There were some trumpet players and, and also Elbjörg was uh, starting to work with the loops and effects. So I brought, uh, I bought a, a used guitar effect machine, the Digitech, and I bought the Yaman, 
which could take one loop at a time, or you could overdub, but that was it. And and suddenly uh, I felt that I had uh, a tool to make it possible to blend in to that trio uh, in a very different way. So what I experienced then was that the electronics gave me a kind of uh, distance from the voice sound, which was important to be able to play uh, with this trio in other ways. I'll just uh, play a little example to show you uh, what I mean. This is from the trio many years later, but still I think it's, it's uh, possible to see what, what I'm trying to explain here. <laughs> the other side playing the synthesizer and um, to me this uh, this is a good example of how the distance from the natural voice sound can make me give me other roles and, and give me other opportunities in this instrumental interplay so uh, then I uh, will try to talk a little bit about uh, what this distance is from what is it with a voice, what what makes it so hard to to operate uh, with a natural voice in the instrumental setting? And luckily for me, Andreas Bergsland, which is sitting here, uh, <laughs> yes, he he he, and, and he, which who works here at the music um, music technology program at the department of music at NTNU, yeah, uh, he did his PhD uh, researching how we, um, how we can recognize or not recognize or how we, how we re experience is the word, yeah. The, wo the voice in the echosmatic music. And uh, one of his, his uh, important uh, premises, which is of course uh, in some ways very um, obvious, is that the voice, our voice, is, is the primal carrier or of verbal and non-verbal communication. So it's what we've always used and what we listen for. And that makes us, uh, um, we have an, an early developed perceptions towards the voice. We prioritize voice over all other sounds. And of course we do because as a baby you are a really... Uh, dependent on the the sound of your mother and your father and so on. So, this is not strange. Uh, and then that's also we ha we have actually a genetic reason for for uh, seeing the vocalist as the main person in the band. <laughs> <laughs> so, and Andreas made this model, um, which where he explains uh, uh, the experience of sound in music. Uh, as a kind of a continuum, 
uh, between two extreme poles. Uh, the the one extreme pole is, is the maximal voice, uh, which is uh, easy to hear. It also has a clear meaning, and, and he exemplifies it with uh, the the news reader in the radio. Uh, or we could also say that the way I'm talking now, when I'm not <clears throat> coughing, is uh, is the maximal voice. And then he says at the that the other extreme is the the voice that is so processed that you you don't recognize it, that voice. I could try to give you an example, hopefully here. No, we do not know what we really know. So this is the, know. the, vo the, uh, we do the not sentence know I know with a, with a what rather maximal really know. voice. We do not know. We do not know. We do not know. We do not know. And at some point, you don't recognize it necessarily as voice anymore. So, uh, he says uh, that this continuum is not only about the processing of the voice. Uh, he sets up uh, this continuum in, in or, or devices into premises for our experience of voice, where he talks about, it's also about, in the music, the focus of attention, uh, the density of information, the naturalness and the presence and the clarity of meaning, uh, feature salience and stream integration. And I cannot, you can talk with Andreas about this because it's really interesting, but we'll not go in depth. But one of the things I really, uh, that really made me interested uh, was uh, the meaning in, in the voice. <clears throat> because the voice uh, is a carrier of meaning. Um, we, we usually think about words as meaning, as I use now. This is meaningful, you can understand me, and so on. Uh, and uh, composers who work with, with the spoken word, uh, for example, Kathy Lane here, uh, says she sets up a kind of continuum with, between uh, words as defining the real world and music as defining an abstract word. Uh, which I can go along with, and and in some way it's it's very, uh, what do you call it? it it's uh, very overlapping with Andreas' model in a way. Uh, but I think uh, when we talk about meaning and words and voice, uh, there's a lot of things you do with your voice that means something, without being words. You can you can make a sound with your voice, and you can express. An emotion. Actually, it's 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 hard for us to make a sound without bringing in any meaning. A, a totally neutral sound. What would that be? With a voice. Um, and this um, continuum uh, between uh, maximal, minimum, uh, real world, um, abstract world. And, and, and Andreas also calls it the, the central zone and the peripheral zone. To me, it's very much about uh, the same things uh, happening. Uh, and it's at this, uh, when I look at this continuum, I think that, uh, or I experience, that this uh, access to meaning that the voice has is a blessing and a curse. <laughs> uh, and that's my experience as a vocalist, because... Uh, it's sometimes it's so difficult to to avoid this emotional meaning uh, area when you want to uh, and and only move into this abstract uh, field of music. Uh, on the other hand, and as I probably demonstrated when I started today, words are so strong, uh, and, and and to bring in the real world is really also a, a really great opportunity that you have as a singer. So, to me, uh, why am I interested in this? <laughs> I, I wonder, and why am I talking so much about this? Uh, because it's, of course, a very intuitive thing. But to, to dig into those things has really made me aware of uh, what my artistic material is. And that, as a vocalist, being able to go into those abstract peripheral zones uh, makes, me, makes it possible to to uh, work with that uh, as an artistic material in itself. So I will try to uh, give you some examples of how I think 
uh, I play with these zones uh, in in this duo with uh, my um, friend and colleague drummer Thomas Stone. He plays with both drums and electronics, and it's not always easy to hear who does what. But I'll, I'll give an example where I think that I'm using these zones as artistic material in the interplay. sound is uh, always a part of this continuum between the zones. Uh, I also think about sounds as a sound quality in themselves. I, I, and this is also more intuitive than it's kind of analytical when I work. Um, and to take part of, in these improvisations, uh, one of the things you uh, which is turns out to be important is that you in some way can imagine the sound that is going to come. Sometimes it's okay to just, you know, go into something and don't really have control. But other times it's very nice to know, okay, I want to do exactly that. And with electronics, there are so many possibilities and choices about what sound quality I want to use. So I registered that I tend to categorize uh, in a very simple and experiential way, not a technological or theoretical way, uh, some, some different categories of what I did with sound. Uh, one of them is broadening, uh, which is about making the voice bigger, fatter, like you do with a, a pitch shifter or a chorus or a phaser or anything that kind of doubles up or, or gives something, adds something. So an example of this, This was also uh, me and Thomas Strun, which also the next example is uh, what I call narrowing. When I filter my voice, I feel that I kind of mix it smaller and tighter. Just a small example of that. Call something placing, and this isn't something you recognize uh, from production, post production. Every time you work with a reverb, it's about the room. Where, where are you close? Are you distant? Where where are you in this room? And this is uh, something uh, that is uh, important, <laughs> an important um, material actually uh, that I notice that I play a lot with close, near, distant. 
Um, and uh, but I, I'll, I'll, the next example is about that, but it's also about what I call reconstructing the voice, and that's uh, what you do when you, yeah, like you use granulation, you slice it up, uh, you have uh, different uh, ways of making the voice very different. In this example, it's just a uh, uh, which I, I like it. That's why I play it. It's with Marilyn Masur, Danish uh, percussionist. And what happened was that I made a kind of granular loop that uh, I placed in a bigger room. And this uh, was what started out the whole improvisation. And so it's, it's what, what's in the bottom is kind of my reconstructed voice. And then the rest is working with, among other things, placing. It's not only about the sound quality, it's very much about the sound organize, organization. Um, as opposed to the acoustic uh, voice, able to do sound just as long as you can do a breathe and then you have to stop, uh, like the trumpet player as well, uh, and, uh, and a lot of other instruments. So this possibility to to uh, work with loops and repetition it is a dramatic difference, of course, uh, and also the possibility to work with multiple layers at the same time uh, is not possible with acoustic voice, except from perhaps Bob McFerrin and, and a couple of other uh, vocalists. But but uh, this is really something very different, <clears throat> and also the possibility to work with pre-sample sound. Uh, either if you have a kind of sound li library, which I have here on this Roland, uh, with sounds that I can just use. Uh, and also this possibility of looping something and then uh, taking it away and then bringing it back in the same performance at another place. And this character that it changes from something being uh, directly to a memory or something that happened a while ago, which, which changes actually the meaning of the material as well. So an uh, ex example of this, this is me and Thomas again.
these uh, new possibilities makes it possible to take on some new roles as a singer. So here I have uh, all my roles uh, that I uh, alternate. Uh, the singer, of course, with melody, uh, with or without words, uh, often in the musical focus, often with a natural voice, uh, close to the central zone, if we use Andreas' uh, uh, model. Uh, the speaker as well as even maybe even closer into the central, in the middle of the central zone, uh, if he speaks the understandable text and so on. Uh, but then we have the sound maker, uh, which is not in that kind of focus, which can add color to or accompany or comment or interact with the other musicians, uh, where you don't experience meaning that much. Uh, and you are moving towards this peripheral zone. Uh, and then uh, you have the role I maybe use mostly, this, the sound singer, which can uh, move between these positions in the interplay, uh, partly being here, partly being there, and, and these transitions in between. Uh, and I will show you just a few examples, because uh, in different settings, this can be uh, harder or easier to to uh, to explore these roles. This is one uh, example with my trio Bould with Hans Magnus Rion and Stian Westerhus, uh, which is part of a more conventional sound. There's a guitar solo, and I'm just trying to accompany that as a sound maker. <laughs> again, which is easier to, there, where it's easier to, to change roles and go in between. This is from a project we did uh, called Skylab Audiovision. And this is a, uh, an example where I, I think I use all these <clears throat> different roles and change between them, uh, working with multiple layers, taking the text, the singer role, and repetition and samples and so on. So. Remember that the earth spins round. Remember that the earth spins. The earth 
also an example, I think, of how the loop uh, kind of changes meaning when you repeat it uh, and, and you come back with it. Uh, I'll, I'll have some time, I think, uh, just to talk briefly about uh, the vocal ensemble. I was a leader of Trondheim Voices. I'm still a member of it, but I, I, when I was a leader, I had a vision about the, every singer being able to control some of their own sounds, especially reverbs, but also uh, to be able to process every vocal sound uh, vo uh, with wireless controllers uh, and using the bodies. And we started to work on that uh, with uh, kind of different experiments. And this experience ended with our sound designer, Oscar Costa, wanted actually to build us a custom-made uh, controller, which I have here, the Makatrol which we can carry like this, <laughs> very convenient, very easy, user-friendly, because it's not all of us who really dive into this uh, control um, thing. <laughs> so, uh, and this, this uh, of course, as I said, uh, this um, blending is not a problem in the vocal ensemble because we have voices, all of us. But what it does is to uh, bring in this more abstract world that I talked about and, and creates another dimension to the vocal ensemble. Just a short example of this. just a short example I could talk a lot about that but you can ask me afterwards if you want to uh, finally and for a short discussion afterwards I want to mention some challenges that I experience uh, there's a lot of challenges and I could talk a lot about all of them but but uh, I would like to focus on this the challenge by using these instruments that I experience and one of them uh, and, and it's it's very much about habits and possibilities and also about control and not. Uh, so one of the challenge is about repetition because this equipment makes it so easy to work with repetition and loops. And I think there's a really thin line between when you come into them, something that is a long stretch which is hypnotizing and a long stretch which is static and not developing. Uh, and there are ways to work around this, but uh, it's also, I think it's, it's something in, uh, to have your mind set on. At least for me, I have to really work with, with getting out of this uh, constant repetition mode and, and daring to, take, to make breaks and, and shortcuts. Uh, so because it's slow transformation is wonderful to work with electronics, but it's also possible to work with, with short sounds, uh, you just have to, you know, have, to me, I have to practice it and have to, to have a mindset on it and, and find ways to do that, to work with breaks, to dare to break, to br dare to bring in pauses, not at least. Uh, another uh, challenge is about layers. Uh, it's, it's interesting because um, Maya Rochke, one of, uh, of course, my influences, uh, was here for a workshop and someone said, how many layers can you play at one time and still, you know, feel them? <clears throat> and I was expecting, well, depends, you know, and, and that kind of answer. And, and she said, four. <laughs> and I was, I was really surprised. Uh, so, um, and, and uh, I, it was very nice that she said that because it, it, at least there's a limit 
I think of it as, you know, in no way you would say having balls in the air. How many balls can you, you know, keep alive? Or when is the ball dead? Uh, because you, you started, you, you stopped thinking about it because you got occupied with something else. So that's something that I try to, to work with all the time. Uh, not all the time, of course, but I <laughs> try to have a consciousness about that. Uh, and the setup. Um, this is a challenge uh, I also experience working with uh, TMP, which even, even uh, and all of these challenges we have talked about in the work with TMP, which even Vansek leads. Uh, um, so there, we have all these possibilities, and we, it's easy to map. Uh, so it's very easy to change your setup all the time. But at what time uh, do you kind of get your instrument in your hand if you change it all the time? Uh, and to me, that leads to the to the second question. Uh, also, uh, what are we after? Are we after the really complex uh, things happening, or are we? Uh, you know, there is a balance, I think, between being uh, an improviser uh, and having a kind of intuitive relation to everything that's that happening, and, and also have it in your mind and in your fingers, uh, and. Uh, the ability to take chances and to push buttons and don't know, uh, don't knowing what's going to happen, which is also a fantastic opportunity, of course, in music technology. But this is a balance I, I feel can be a cha challenge sometimes. Okay, questions? Yeah. Do I look at Oslo when I see that way? Hmm? Is Oslo kind of, is this Oslo or should I see this? Is this Oslo? That's Oslo. Hi, Oslo. <laughs> because I see you there, yeah. Thank you for such an inspirational talk. And we might, just to give room to Oslo, Trondheim, and also online uh, viewers to have questions, we might start here in Trondheim and then ping to Oslo where Marie will um, coordinate and then if uh, someone from the internet wants to ask, they are welcome to. So are there any questions here in the room? Yes. We have a long cable, so. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, hi. hi. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a question about um, your experiences working with this kind of technology live uh, mm. when you're meeting uh, uh, a sound technician who's gonna like do the sound for the mm. concert. Uh, my experience is that um, people, sound technicians, want that control themselves, which mm. you uh, you take that control. Mm. So how has that been? <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting question, and it's uh, I I can tell about two things because the um, when I work. Or there's a lot of because it, it depends a little bit on the setting. When I uh, work with Bool and Snow, which is my prog rock impro band, uh, we have uh, our sound engineer, and he and this it, it's a kind of uh, this it's loud. It's really really loud. So 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 I have to give him to be sure that that my voice is heard. I have to give him a clean line as well, you know, to be sure that he can lift it up without getting my feedback, some feedback issues and so on. And I don't like it and it's been problematic for me because uh, then I, I really don't know how much, uh, how much the audience here or of the other things that I work with of effects. And it's, but it's a problematic situation anyway because it's so loud. So, <laughs> so, so but, but then you have uh, like playing with Thomas, no problem, I can just Tell we have used like Taria Holland. I can say, uh, please don't do anything. Or if you, but, but I also often in the, in the beginning I was really strict about it. But after a while I said, okay, if you experience that this room's little, a little bit of reverb just for the room, and you, if you want to keep me in the same room as Thomas, you can do that. You know, but no delays, and no effects. Uh, and sometimes he did it, uh, but it's okay. When you start to know someone and trust their the ju judgment, uh, it's um, uh, it's okay, but uh, but it's a problem and it's a challenge. Uh, another thing I want to talk about is uh, is Osle Costa, 
uh, when we started with, uh, I started to talk with him about, not about this, but this come later, but about this handing over the control uh, from from him to us in the vocal ensemble. He was very reluctant in the beginning, and I understand him, because losing that control, it's kind of losing your identity as a sound engineer or sound designer, uh, as he is. So, but that's been a process. And what's interesting that he built this, he, he's planning this, and he's working. We, we, we do this with the Ableton Live, and he's working together with us to find out how we can. And, and suddenly, he's a part of the music. Uh, you know, he's part of designing our music as well through this cooperation. Yeah, that's a long answer. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Any more questions here? Trondheim, shall we ask in Oslo if there is any question? Anyone has any questions? So you have the microphone here. <coughs> okay. Can you hear me up there? I can hear you, Alexander. Uh, hi. Hi. <laughs> I, I was just so curious to hear about um, the experience of using this. Uh, what was the name of this little thing again? Maca. Maca troll. Maca troll. Yeah. How did it change kind of the experience of performing? I mean, being bodies together with the voices, and then also having this device. Did it, Did you feel that like you kind of integrated with this, and kind of it felt as part of of the ensemble? Yes. Uh, eventually, because and that's really important to say that this needs a lot of work. And it, it leads a lot of common work together. It's not enough that everyone has a kind of test to market all and we can sit home and rehearse. We need to do it together. And we have to deal with all those challenges uh, with uh, doing too much, uh, putting on drones that never end. And we have had serious situations <laughs> in that group, you know, discussing, wow, didn't you hear that you should turn up that loop? And, you know, so... So it's not, uh, but but finally uh, or eventually. Now we made a record using only Macat or you know the, the Macatrol project because we do several things. We don't only work with this. <coughs> Sorry, and uh, where we 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 did a lot of recordings and and we started to listen to it, to it and we were kind of amazed uh, about some of the things that happened, and uh, so it. Um, the question was if it became a part of us, and yes, now it is a part of us, but it's a lot of work. And sometimes it's not, you know, it, it's still sometimes suddenly things happen and you don't, you know, you, yeah, you don't use it as organic as you should and so on. Yeah. Any other questions here in Trondheim? No questions, no suggestions? It's okay. Yeah, <laughs> Oslo. <clears throat> so then we can uh, thanks thank the speaker. And thank you. Thank you, thank Oslo. You <laughs>